Well, hello there. It is great to see you again, and welcome back to Path to Abundant Living. I am your moderator, Ryan Ruff. It's great to be back with everybody today, and as always, I'll be joined by my right-hand men, and that's Mr. Matt Nordman and Scott Morrison of Morrison Nordman Wealth Management. And we've got a really special episode for you all on tap today. We have a really great guest that's joining us, and that's Mr. Joe Navarro. Joe is an author, a public speaker, and he's a former FBI agent and supervisor. And Joe really specializes in the area of nonverbal communication and body language as a whole. So as we've had these discussions on this show surrounding elements maybe beyond wealth management, maybe the growth of your professional network, how you carry yourself, how you really uh, establish that professional network and those professional relationships to further enhance your business and your life. Well, we thought Joe would be a phenomenal guest to come on the show today to talk about his expertise in this area of nonverbal communication, body language, his experiences, and how that could all tie into the work that you're doing in your life and your professional world. But first, before we bring Joe on and get into the conversation, let's say hi to the guys. Scott, Matt, it's good to see you this morning. How are you both doing? Ryan, it's an unbelievable day. Excited for this show. And Scott, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you wonderful. guys? Fantastic. Yeah, no, doing well, doing well. Uh, excited to jump into today's episode. We've got a great guest, obviously, on tap. Before we bring Joe out and get into all our questions that we've got, Matt, why don't you tee things up for us? How come, uh, you know, how did you guys land on Joe and how, how come you wanted to bring him on the show in the first place? Sure. So for me, I don't know how many years ago, it was at least probably 15 ish, 20 years ago. I remember uh attending a conference and they brought someone in who talked about nonverbal communications body language and what you can learn and all this other stuff and it and it fascinated me fast forward a little bit and then have a, a group of us who get together for just some friendly poker and so you know being the competitive person i am you always want to get better and so you start reading and and one of the books i came across was joe's book read them and reap with what some would say the greatest tournament poker player in the in history of Phil Hellmuth. And I was like, well, I got to read this book. And it just continued to open up more and more in my mind of, wow, this there's a lot that we all can learn. And so, so then it was like, well, how can people who are dealing with other professionals or, hey, you got a, a contractor and it's like, is this someone that I can trust? Or is there something that I can learn from the interactions that I have with them? Because as, as Joe will attest to, if you watch or read any of his stuff, it's we are always giving off some sort of signal. And so, well, why not, you know, speak with the man himself, the expert? And so on top of that, my uncle, so Joe, 25 years FBI, my uncle was um, in the FBI in Washington, D.C. I don't know what he did. I know he was important, but, you know, so you, you tie all that stuff together. And I, and I am just very curious. And very excited to uh, speak with Joe today. Well, fantastic. Well, with that, folks, we want to welcome Joe Navarro to the show. Joe, thank you so much for carving some time out of your day to be with us. And uh, welcome to Path to Abundant Living. It's a great to be here. And uh, it, it was, uh, boy, that is a long way to get me to, uh, to, uh, to the show. But uh, I'm very appreciative. Um, you, you've mentioned some things uh yeah, you're, uh, you know, the, the folks that have served in the in the FBI in the past, uh, what sacrifices they made, and so uh, a tribute to uh, to your relative. And, uh, um, yeah, I still remember working with Phil Helmuth. That was uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, funny story about that. He he, uh, I had written some articles for Psychology Today, and he called me up, and uh, I didn't, I don't play poker and he said uh, I'd like for you to come out and teach at the uh, I'm putting on an academy and I hung up on him because I, I didn't know who he was <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't know that at that time he'd already won 10 bracelets and he was number one in the world in winnings and I was like <laughs> I thought it was this a joke a prank call. it's a prank call you're being pranked Joe I was being pranked by the best and uh, his manager called me back and said, no, this is serious. And, uh, and uh, that actually that led to writing the book uh, to which you were referring, which uh, uh, yeah. Read them and read. Interestingly enough is, you know, I, I did it just as a favor. Uh, 
you, you never realized that that book would become uh, for about a year was number one in the world for poker players. I, <laughs> I, I, could... I hope they benefited from it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't play poker. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, you're always, for lack of a better term, when, if you are competitive, you're looking for that edge, yeah. even if it's just a, a, a tiny little edge and, you know, probably, you know, speaking with Phil, I don't, you know, how much he would say, but, you know, with, if you can get that edge, that's the difference between winning and losing. Well, I've, absolutely. And, and in fact, he told me the, you know, the, his takeaways from that and, and actually their takeaways for negotiations. Um, one of the things that we talked about was that uh, if you, if you, if you hold very still at the table, um, and he does that. He does a, you know, what we call the perch. He just sort of settles down, and uh, people sort of ignore you. And it's and it's great for poker, but it's not very good for um, uh, for negotiations and uh, and and even for uh, online uh, communications. Um, you know, we, uh, you and I, uh, Matt, we were uh, talking earlier about um how things have changed you know we've, we've gone from being in the same room um and you know and i think we're getting back to that but not in the same way um i'm i'm seeing more and more um events which are half virtual half present um but one of the things we learned as, as a result of COVID and everybody turning to, uh, to a virtual environment was how essential it was to have good production quality. That the camera that came with your uh, computer was probably not as good as it should be. That using a 4K camera, using uh, lighting, um, using a speaker or a uh, microphone to enhance your voice um, contributed to, uh, to, to keeping your audience. And, uh, and something so simple as uh, not realizing that for the last 70 years, television always had the, the, the person on TV, whether it was Walter Cronkite or uh, any of those folks, that they never took up more than a fourth of the uh, of the screen, and uh, come COVID, and then all of a sudden everybody has uh, their face right into the screen. We're looking at nose hairs and, and things, and uh, <laughs> it it just turned ugly there for a while. And uh, the great experiment that took place was that all of a sudden companies like yourself, uh, where your clients are important they were making assessments as to quality, uh, as to competence, as to truthfulness, veracity. Uh, as I said, uh, the big one, confidence, based on their observations. And, uh, and it was a real eye-opener, and we saw dramatically uh, the numbers which we could for the first time measure because, uh, you know, as you said, it's one thing is to get together at a hotel, everybody gets invited uh, to your city and you have four or five presenters and uh, you have a nice convivial meeting and fee people feel obligated to stay throughout the event. When we went virtual, that went out the door. People were starting to sign off as early as seven minutes if the production quality wasn't there. Um, and that was a real shakeup. Um, I, I remember a lot of companies contacting me and saying, how do we fix this? And, uh, and saying, uh, yeah, we've gone from, uh, from giving presentations to, um, to giving performances. And a lot of people said, well, we weren't hired for that. When I said, congratulations, <laughs> you now have a new skill set to learn because people can now uh, 
just tune you off so easily that uh, it, it really is a game changer. It really is a, a, a game changer. Well, I, it definitely is. And so, so if we can take just one step back. And so for, for the lay person who doesn't know anything about this, yeah. you just kind of get into a little bit about the, the nonverbal communications that we are all giving off every second of every day. Every and second. I mean. Yeah. Great question. I probably should have started with that because um, I think most people understand body language. Um, you know, obviously that's uh, the gestures that we use, the expressions of the face and so forth. Uh, but nonverbals goes beyond that. Nonverbals is the umbrella uh, that covers that thin slice of body language. And nonverbals really are anything that communicates, uh, but is not a word. And so uh, the, the background behind me, how I'm dressed, these are considered nonverbals. My tone of voice, uh, what we call prosody, is a nonverbal. The things that I attach to myself, whether I'm using my favorite fountain pen or my favorite cheap pencil, <laughs> these things communicate. And really the first great experiment that took place in the last century dealing with uh, nonverbals was the first televised debate between president, uh, um, uh, president elect uh, Kennedy and vice president Nixon. And at that 1960 event, something happened that um, uh, kept social scientists studying for a long time. Those who listened on the radio were adamant that Richard Nixon won, and and rightfully so. He was the more more experienced uh, statesman. He'd been around for a long time. He was vice president. But the the magic happened when the the cameras came on, and there was Kennedy about an inch taller, handsome. He was wearing a bespoke suit. He was very casual, very at ease, very friendly. And the audience said, uh, no, Kennedy won by a factor of two, twice as many people. And for the first time, social scientists said, well, wait a minute, we all listen to the same words but it was the nonverbals, the, the, the casualness, the friendliness, the fact that he wore makeup. Nixon refused to wear makeup. Kennedy said, bring it on. And didn't didn't and Nixon have a five o'clock shadow as well, right? Nixon had a five o'clock shadow. He was nursing a cold, but he just didn't want to be touched. And he just didn't realize that he had to go from what Kennedy realized was to go from a presentation to a performance. Kennedy got it in the same way that, you know, we, we, uh, we look at young people on TikTok and, uh, and we may joke about them, but some of them have uh, a million followers. Yeah. And, but you look at their production quality and you say, oh, they're putting on makeup. They've got not one, two, but three ring lights. They're using a 4K camera. And I try to convince people, you know, most of my clients are in the financial sector. And I try to tell my clients, gang, you got to get your act together. <laughs> if you're using the camera that came with, with, with your laptop, uh, you, you got to elevate this because the people on TikTok with a million viewers, they get it. Uh, and they're using studio quality microphones. And so it's, uh, that was the big revelation about how much we needed to change and this transition. Um, and, and a lot of companies, and, and I admire uh, JP Morgan, uh, uh, you know, Mary Erdos and, and her folks and uh, uh, Capital Group uh, out of California. I've worked with all of them. They got it immediately. 
I mean, immediately. They were buying microphones, cameras, whatever, elevating their game. And with the mindset that uh, the game has changed. It's no more presentations. We have to do performances. And the time frame. When I started working with, for instance, JP Morgan, usually uh, people would be brought in to talk about a product or a service. They would get an hour. 18 minutes is now all you get. Hmm. Those days are over. <laughs> if you can't sell your product in 18 minutes, <laughs> well, uh, you, you just don't stand a chance. But we did we live in a microwave society, right? And if it doesn't happen quickly, and, and like you were talking about, whether it's the quality, if, if I'm surprised you get 18 minutes, I would have thought it would be even less than that. So yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's right at that, at that 18 minute mark, you know, that's it. And, and I mean, you're talking about some products that are very complex. And, uh, and obviously, the, the, the sort of sales pitch is done in 18 minutes, and then you have the potential for breakout sessions so that uh, further details are, are broken out. But we call that the TED Talk effect. You know, most TED Talks are 12 minutes. Um, and, and forget about having a lectern. <laughs> if, if you have to read, if you have to stand behind an object to give your presentation, uh, wow, <laughs> it's like you're, you're, you're hurting. And I, you know, I work with individuals and I coach them I, and, you know, you, you just try to get in their head and say, yeah, I know how we used to do it. Those days are over. Yeah. They're over, uh, you know, slides that were complicated, you know, now, it's the, the the Steve Jobs uh, method: one word or one picture, but that's it. Yeah, to your, to your point, uh, Joe. One of the things that I've certainly learned: I'm I'm 63 myself, and I have, a, you know, a client base who's a little bit older. And so, before COVID, it would have been um, unheard of to have a Zoom meeting, uh, having the you know where my clients had had the expectation of always seeing me face to face, yeah. and we always were able to have conversations, see each other's gestures and things like that. So sure. to sell the idea of a Zoom call, the production quality had to be really well. You, you kind of joked about the nose hairs, but that's the kind of thing people, when they're sitting in front of you, notice. <laughs> and they want to know when they're having a conversation with you that they can see your your uh, mannerisms and they can see your smile and they can see you you know, showing attention to what they're talking about. Uh, this isn't going to happen on a phone call and it certainly wasn't going to happen, uh, uh, you know, with any, any other kind of old video type of production. Yeah. Scott, I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. Um, the, 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 the takeaways that your clients are taking is they're still looking at you to see if you're friendly. They're still looking at you to see if you're engaged. Um, they're still relying on your words. To be sure, obviously we have advice for them and, and so forth, um, but trustworthiness, we still assess uh, by looking at each other. Uh, we assess competence uh, and confidence in the same way. So I think, I think even though the medium now is this small and our gestures now have to go from out here to uh, here. So when we're talking to the clients, we you know, we have to limit those gestures. We can still use them powerfully to convey structure, to convey strength, to convey that we have well thought this out. Uh, we can still do it that way, but we can also use our our faces, uh, head tilt, uh, to say, you know, I'm engaged, I'm listening to what you're saying. We can arch the eyes to greet, to reward them uh, when they say something interesting oh wow i didn't think about that or yeah that's a good point we can use the these gestures and even though they don't see uh, all of the body uh, we can still do a lot and it is true um, in one of my books i i think it was in uh, my and uh, be exceptional i talk about that the 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 primacy of communication uh, as adults 
is uh, first visual, then verb, then vocal, so tone of voice, then verbal, the words that we use, and last, uh, haptics or touch. Now, obviously, we can't shake hands over the um, over this environment, but we're still influenced by what we see. We're still influenced by the tone of voice, what we call prosody, um, how we uh, how we sound, uh, the pitch, whether we talk with cadence or we machine gun information. Then we have words, and uh, and obviously we can't touch, but we can approximate uh, that by the kinds of things we say as we terminate by saying, hey, it was really great to see you. Um, let's do this again. Um, and, uh, and I really uh, appreciate your time. So we can make up for, for, for some of that, not perfectly, but, but, uh, but good enough. But it's, this is a medium that's not gonna go away. I, I just came from California where I, I can't say the, the corporation, it's a huge corporation. Uh, they're in the news, advertising, and, uh, and, and writing business. Fully 76% of their staff now works from home. Wow. That is huge. I was, I was at their headquarters and I just couldn't, I was looking around like, and I, I thought have, have all these people, as they say in England, been made redundant. And they said, no, they're fully employed, but they're working from home. And, uh, uh, but we have, Every morning we have a meeting. Every afternoon we have a meeting, and it's all virtual. And uh, we've we've learned to, uh, to to manage it. So I, you know, I it's not going to go away. Um, I think in the financial sector, because of the way the financial sector works, where there's a lot of mentoring, um, and and you learn so much just by being with each other. I think it's um, it's going to take a lot longer uh to uh to have those kinds of percentages but uh i think virtual will be with us for a long time so so let me ask you this so in the setting like that you know and in, in your ted talk one of the things that you would yeah. indicate is that making people comfortable and being empathetic that's the real significance to be able to identify the the nonverbal cues so whether it's face to face like we're in the same room versus Zoom, are there differences or what should people be doing and or looking for in those situations? Yeah, uh, he, he, here's here's one, uh, Matt. It's really easy. Just turn sideways a little bit. So really? You're, 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 yeah, you're straight on to, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just that behavior alone guarantees more face time than if you were looking straight ahead. By just by just looking straight ahead, the way you were sitting, eventually it wears on my brain, right? We we know this from the research that uh, even if you angled a little bit more, so just angle a little bit more, you're still looking at me, but your shoulders are there. You go. Just that, just that guarantees that I will listen to you longer. Than if you straight stood in front of me like a drill sergeant. That's fascinating to me. It's listen. It, trust me, it's worth a oh, lot. Oh, I do. <laughs> I do. I'm listen. sure some of our yeah, I'm sure some of our clients who are business owners who are in negotiations and it, that the, that'll be a great takeaway from this. Oh, it's, it's a great takeaway, but think about it. When we're confrontational, we square up on people, right? We are. Shoulders are square. We look like drill sergeants. And, you know, I, I tell this to parents, don't be surprised if, if this is how you have every conversation with your spouse or every conversation with your child. Don't be surprised when they become teenagers and they don't really want to talk to you too much. <laughs> um, from an anthropological standpoint, primates, and we are primates, only approach each other directly when there's tension or there's going to be a fight and so forth. 
when 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 uh, uh, and we are hominins, the best way to to get along is to uh, approach each other at angles and maintain angles. And by doing that, that actually increases um, face time. Number one, it increase it increases uh, the uh, comfort discomfort. So we have more positive. Uh, what we call valence in psychology, but it also releases those hormones that contribute to social uh, harmony, like oxytocin. The minute you square up on somebody and you're staring them down, cortisol begins to <laughs> to erode away at you, and uh, and limits the amount of time. So just just that alone. The other thing we can do is do use more head tilt as you're uh, listening to a person. Just a little bit of head tilt as you're pondering or considering what they're saying at a subconscious level says, what you have to say is important to me. And even though I may have an agenda, I'm putting it on hold while I listen to you. Just, just a, li a little head tilt. And so, in essence, your body language is rewarding them for talking. Not something we get every day, right? It's <laughs> very our, true. Our, sure. our siblings, our, our co-partners, whatever, we don't always get that. And so, it's so encouraging when you finally, in the presence of somebody that sits there and tilts their head and just ponders about what you have to say. And then, of course... Uh, arching of the eyebrows that uh, we're impressed or, or, or that we are receiving it. And, um, and I always uh, teach that, and it's a verbal thing, that one of the easiest things that we can do is um, and, and whenever somebody says something, um, to a large extent, we can always agree uh, but also add. Uh, and if we can't agree and add, at least be agreeable. Hmm. Uh, so somebody says, oh, you know, parking downtown is really tough. It, it really is. You know, I, 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 wish, I, I wish it weren't so. Maybe one day we'll have uh, uh, these uh, these helicopters that'll move us. Right? So you've agreed and you've added. But let's say they say something controversial that you don't uh, agree with. Uh, you know, it's uh, well downtown is is going downhill. Um, you know, it's you could easily go easily go down that route, but you could also be agreeable and 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 at least just say. Um, I, I, I know what you're saying, uh, but hopefully in our office, you'll find some refuge. So at least you're being agreeable. So yeah. agree and add anytime you can, especially with our clients. Uh, and if you can't do that, at least be agreeable so that um, this, this concept of anytime, you know, they see Scott, anytime they see Matt, and these people are in your presence, um, they walk away with uh, a high degree of comfort. And that alone uh, can contribute to, uh, to your success. Okay. Joe, I've, I've heard uh, Stephen Covey, uh, the author, uh, use the phrase, listen to understand uh, rather than listen to reply. Um, seems like that's a big challenge in today's society with you know, yep. the need to be relevant uh, across all the different social media avenues that we have and and how uh, something as simple as, you know, I mean, politics has always been a, a hot button with people, but the fact that we can, you know, can have this machine gun conversation, as you called it, uh, yep. where we're really not trying to understand each other, but we're just replying as quickly as we can to get our point across because we have a, a platform by which to do it now uh what are yeah. your thoughts in that regard well i'm glad you asked uh because uh 
and, and this isn't to show off, but uh, Stephen Covey was one of my professors at Brigham Young University when I was there in 1971 and 72. He, he wasn't famous then. Uh, in fact, uh, what he was famous for was was uh, this. <laughs> he always, uh, my, my, my only takeaway from a semester was always have a three by five card and write your notes on there. Hmm. Uh, but maybe that's more a reflection on me, but he was a great professor. He was big on listening. Um, and obviously politics weren't uh, uh, what they were uh, then. I, I started to notice this a few years ago when I had a photograph of a behavior and I was at an event and somebody raised their hand in the uh, the uh, audience and said, uh, what party are you? Uh, I go, what, what do you mean? And then he said, well, you know, are, are you this party or that party? And I said, why are you asking? He says, well, why are you using that photograph? I said, because it was free and on the internet. <laughs> you know, it's like, I didn't... <laughs> I, I started to realize, and it's only gone downhill ever uh, ever since. I think we have to be, you know, obviously um, these things trend. And I think uh, nowadays we have to be careful as to what we say and what we <laughs> claim to agree with or, or not. Um, you know, obviously, the 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 easiest thing is always to I always try to avoid uh, politics and and uh, and religion. Uh, I'm not smart enough to to have the eloquence to convince anybody either in politics or religion. So why would I say anything? Uh, I I you know I I tell people you know I've uh, I've read thousands of books. I um, I do that to help me educate others, but uh, I I'm not I'm never there to convince. I'm there to convey, and I just leave it at that. I I have no. Uh, I I never try to convince anybody of anything. Uh, people are uh, you know people are very uh, peculiar when it comes to uh, 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 to beliefs. Um, and so, but I think we, we can provide a platform where people, uh, can be, can be heard, but at the same time, I, I have heard of, uh, of instances where, um, at financial meetings, somebody's tried to hijack the meeting to insert some sort of, uh, political, um, uh, statement. And and that's something that uh, you know future generations may have to uh, deal with, but I think it's a good policy to to the extent that we can. Yeah. So to, to listen and be empathetic, but I I always say, folks, I'm not here to convince. I'm here to convey. <laughs> so so Joe, when 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 you're conveying or someone else is, yeah, you've done over 13,000 interviews. Yes. And and I know your answer, but I know there's a lot of people who would love to know your answer. Yeah. So to be able to tell when someone's lying, is it touching the face, clutching the throat, or looking up to the left or looking up to the right? So what is the one thing? So when someone's talking to someone and they say, oh, I pick up on it, what's that thing? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um. You know, if you had asked me that question when I first entered into law enforcement in 1974, I would have said, oh, you know, my sergeant at the academy said that if you scratch your nose as you're talking, you're lying. The truth is, and, and there's ample research beginning in 1986 with the work of Paul Ekman, Bella DiPaolo, Judy, Verdu uh, uh, Judy Burgoon, Mark Frank, Joe Coolis. Uh, David Givens, um, and even some of my own work, because uh, after retiring from the FBI, I, I got involved in doing research. There is no Pinocchio effect. <laughs> there is no single behavior indicative of deception. Humans, we evolved to uh, be deceptive. 
uh, we actually uh, cannot be uh, honest at all times. And so we learn to, to mask behaviors. Um, we, we cannot say to a mother, boy, that is one ugly child you just gave birth to. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sell in any culture. It doesn't, no matter how ugly that child is. And of course, the, the first day they're all ugly and then they be, become beautiful. And, and even in the FBI, it, it, it wasn't something that I really thought a lot about because in the in the FBI, we have to prove everything that both the witness says and the suspect says. We have to corroborate it. Because if we don't, defense attorney is going to say, well, how do you know that? Well, uh, she said she could see it from that corner. Did you go to the corner and see if she could actually see the bank robber? Uh, no. And now your testimony is out, out, out the window. What I try to use nonverbals for is, number one is to establish control, to let the other person know that uh, I'm in control of the situation and that uh, you know I have the authority to go forward. Number two is to establish some sort of comfort so that the person begins to, um, you're never going to have a, a a perfect baseline. There's a there's a, and and I'm partly to blame for this. I always talk about it's great to have a baseline. Well, anytime somebody's in front of you, that affects your baseline behaviors. Um, the only real way to get baseline behaviors is to put a nanny cam hidden in the house and watch you during the day. That's that's the true way. But to get you somewhere to norm so that if I ask you a question, uh, do you own a Smith & Wesson uh, 38 Model K? Does that question cause you stress? Does it cause you concern? Do we see it because you do a hard swallow? Are you covering your neck? Um, things like that. It's not so much deception. It's, it's more about does the question and your response to it cause you psychological discomfort? And if it does, why is that? Now, you know, in, in my, uh, in my, in my book, uh, what everybody is saying, um, which, uh, well, it's it's in its twelfth uh, or thirteenth year. It's it's still number one in the world, um, uh, shockingly, because I, I was told by the editor that we would be lucky if we had six months shelf life with a book <laughs> like that. So, so be careful with the prognost prognosticators, right? Uh, and I told like my an, wife that. Sounds like an I, economic forecaster. Yeah. I, said, I mean, I, I'll never forget it. He calls, he says, you know, Joe, uh, just, you know, don't get too excited. If we get six months out of this, we'll be happy. I said, oh, okay. So I set the bar really low. Um, when we, uh, you know, there's a, a, a case I talk about in the book where I went to look for a fugitive uh, at this house. The mother was there. And when I mention, is it possible that uh, your son is hiding in the house? That was the only time she covered her 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 neck and uh, would touch her neck. And uh, and so the question, and I I repeated that experiment three times with her. That question was causing her psychological discomfort. And sure enough. We got uh, permission from her and hiding in the closet uh, was her son. Uh, wow. Well, wow, I looked out that day because he had a gun on him and yeah. I could easily have been blown away. I was not very careful. But my point is this, people think that we look for deception. I say, don't look for deception. Look for how well people answer questions look how much detail or lack of detail account for all time and 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 for all uh uh behavior you know when when you and i and uh, you know when uh you know uh 
Ryan, uh, uh, Matt, Scott, when we're doing due diligence about investments, yeah, we listen to what uh, the person says. We look at what they put out, but then we ask questions. And from those questions, we have to ask ourselves, are we satisfied? Uh, is there something here that makes me feel a little unsure? Uh, we have to listen to our bodies. You know, um, uh, Gavin De Becker in the 1980s wrote The Gift of Fear, a great book. Everybody should read that. Uh, any child going to college should, should read that book. And now we know that so much more, we know that both the heart, the brain, uh, uh, well, the, the heart and the stomach have neurons, the very same neurons that we have in the brain and that through the vagal system, uh, bilaterally, we are innervated through the vagus nerve, that uh, the stomach and the heart and the lungs communicate and the throat uh, through the vagus nerve. And that oftentimes that gut feeling that we have, that restrained chest and so forth, uh, that gut feeling that we feel is actually the subconscious uh, revealing that something's not right. And, um, and I think we, you may look at it as illogical. I look at it as, no, this is the way we evolved as a species to listen to the body that is uh, the subconscious that is processing far more information than you can ever process. Um, and, we have to, uh, and we have to listen to that, not for deception, but is there something about this that it, it, it causes us anxiety, concern, or it's, it just seems in, in, uh, incred, incredulous? And I fear that a lot of people now um, leave due diligence to, they, they, out, they outsource it. They outsource it rather than do it themselves, rather than ask those hard questions. Um, and I've been with clients who were making major investments, uh, one of them in Manhattan. And uh, there was just something about the meeting. They invited me. And, um, and uh, so one of the questions that I had them repeat had to do with uh, mitigation of, um, I forget the term now, but uh, there had been issues with uh, fungus fungus infestation and uh, in the past. And as I looked at the, the three people on the other side, it, you could see nothing but psychological discomfort. There was a lot of facial distortion and so forth. And it's a simple question. It either happened or it didn't happen, right? Why should, why should a simple question cause so much... Uh, uh, so much of this. And, you know, that's why I wrote the book, uh, The Dictionary of Body Languages, is anytime you start to see facial distortion, somebody has to answer a question by first throwing their jaw in one direction or, uh, you know, uh, using hidden pacifiers or biting their lip. We don't know the truth, but I can tell you this, there's an issue. <laughs> and, and it's up to me to figure out what is that issue? And sure, and sure enough, and uh, and my client had to walk away from this because the the uh, the issue of uh, just how much fungus and and stuff was in the building uh, really uh, made the support choice for for investment, and uh, and they were hiding it. Clearly, they were hiding it. So I. I've I've read both those books from Gavin DeBecker, and I, I agree that everyone should read it. And and clearly, what you do is is extremely helpful. And and it's evident, like you know, your editor saying, "Oh, maybe get six months." No, I, I think it's it's very obvious why because we all are trying to learn more and more as much as we can, right? And now that what is it, Peacock has that show out. I don't know if you've heard about that Poker Face, right? And can't tell the truth, but I know when you're lying. And so whether that's true or not, but it's again, to, to, to us, this is very fascinating information and, and very appreciative and want to be respectful of your time. Again, as I mentioned, when we were talking earlier, I could 
I could talk to you all day, but I know, we, you know, again, we want to be respectful of your time. Well, thanks. Well, this way you can have me back. So if there's uh, if there's still questions lingering out there. Um, yeah. You know what I would tell you, because uh, I know your clients are important to you. Um, and and you, you can tell you can tell when when someone cares about your clients, that they're not just numbers and, and so forth. And we we can we can learn that we we deduce that based on nonverbals uh, you know we don't say trust me we don't say um you know i like you we demonstrate it and and so i think if you uh adopt uh those best behaviors that communicate uh, interest empathy competence warmth but also strength um I, I think that goes a long way, uh, whether it's your industry or uh, or any other industry. Well, again, we appreciate your time, and and we uh, you you put the offer out there, so you got to be careful because we might be <laughs> be back in touch. <laughs> Joe, well, we, Joe I, yeah, I want to thank you too, Joe. Uh, it was great to have you here today. Uh, it's my 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 pleasure. It's uh, it's been fun. And Joe, I understand that you do uh, con some consulting work in this space of nonverbal communication. For anybody out there in our audience that enjoyed the conversation, maybe took something away from it, what's the best way they could learn more about you online or, or find you or even, you know, open up a dialogue with you? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, most of my stuff, just go to joenavarro.net and that takes you right to my uh, company website. Um and uh, I do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. I do uh, stuff with teams. And uh, yeah, it's always my pleasure to, uh, to uh, en engage the public out there. So thanks for, uh, for this great opportunity, guys. And we can hire you in a big negotiation then, right? <laughs> Your competitors do. <laughs> <laughs> Just, Fair point. Uh, just saying. <laughs> Fair point. Well, Joe, again, we appreciate you stopping by and being with us. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on Path to Abundant Living. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks, thanks a Joe. lot, guys. Have a great day. Alrighty, folks, Joe Navarro, author, public speaker, former FBI agent and supervisor specializing in nonverbal communication and body language. What a guest, a lot of value out there on the table. Guys, I want to get your takeaways from, you know, some of the key messages that uh, Joe shared with us today. Matt, why don't you bat lead off for us? What'd you think? Uh, it was fascinating. Again, as I, as I said, and I still could, I could talk about, read about, learn about this stuff because it is fascinating. Like he says, we are constantly giving off nonverbal cues not only just physically but like he said well if you're doing a zoom well what's behind you or what's you know what's in view of people and how do you act and just all that stuff i you know the the takeaway is you know really not be overly aware but be aware of you know how you are with people and just you know don't don't be fake trying to be something that you aren't but know that, okay, you can be able to see what others are doing and go, oh, maybe there is a red flag there. Or no, I, you know what, this is somebody that is truly genuine and does care about me or what it is that, that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Scott, what were, uh, what were some of the big uh, takeaways for you on your end? Well, I, I think that, you know, from, from my own perspective, uh, obviously sitting down with a client, it makes you um, more self-conscious about what kind of nonverbals you're getting off. But at the same time, the, the refreshing part of it was, you know, when he kept talking about empathy, genuineness, integrity, you know, things, things that you naturally give off good nonverbals when you're being that person. Yeah, and, I uh, agree. I you agree. know, so it, it, in that way, I think, does it give us some clues or cues if we're sitting down with somebody not and, and not in respect to a client, but, uh, you know, to another professional who I'm, you know, deciding on whether I want to work with, certainly it's giving me some more uh, quivers, you know, and, and to be able to, you know, figure out if I'm reading somebody correctly. But um, at the same time, I, I just come away from it thinking, you know, genuine conversation is, 
and, and honesty is what this is all about. And uh, uh, anything we can do to be more aware of our own nonverbals as well as other people's is only going to, you know, help in that regard. What about, absolutely. What you, what'd you take away, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. I would actually, I'd probably marry your, your two school of thoughts and takeaways in, I, I loved when he started to, when, when Joe was sharing uh, about actively listening, you know, the, the head tilt, you know, uh, and what that shows to the individual that you're, that is speaking to you in that, I, yes, of course, you know, we all have thoughts of our own on how we want to respond or where we might want to take the conversation next, but it was very interesting to know that that little head tilt that, hmm, you know, making an audible, hmm, or, or just some sort of visualization to the person that is speaking that you are intently listening and you're putting your thoughts on hold to be able to listen, to internalize, and better yet, maybe even shift what you were going to maybe originally say back to them. Maybe it's, hold on, I like that school of thought. Let's let's take that and run with it uh, in terms of the conversation and maybe not what I had on my agenda and where I wanted to take the conversation. So I love the idea of, of that active listening and kind of the way you can position your body and give off those nonverbal cues to show that you are listening because, um, I mean, it's amazing. I'm sure you guys have plenty of experiences in your lives where uh when where somebody said you know i really appreciate you listening to me in that moment whether it was about a breakup about a piece of investment you know any any sort of kind of hard-hitting conversation when somebody knows that the other person is actively listening i think that conversation as a whole becomes infinitely more valuable uh so that was that was really uh that was really really cool to see uh but i agree i agree matt i i mean joe's fascinating the work that he's been doing i'm sure he's got countless stories that we could sit around and talk about but so uh maybe we will have to have him back on for yeah. a future episode agree agree Awesome. Well, gentlemen, look, I really appreciate you both, of course, as always, carving time out of your days. Guys, one final time, though, for anybody that enjoys the conversations that we have on this show, maybe they want to reach out directly to you guys. What is the best way they can get in touch with your team to have one of these maybe wealth management discussions? Yeah, so the traditional way, phone call 517-333-7967 or our website, morrisonnordman.com. Fantastic. Well, look, Matt, Scott, I appreciate you both. Uh, I'll let you get back to serving your clients and doing what you do best, but uh, we'll see you back here for the next one. All right. Have a great day, Ryan, Scott. See you soon. All right. All righty, folks. And hey, look, we want to take one final moment, as we always do, and thank you for stopping by and being a part of the show today. If you did enjoy today's discussion surrounding these nonverbal communication skills and body language with Joe Navarro, and you know you enjoyed today's conversation, you took something away from it, make sure you hit that subscribe button then on whichever platform you checked us out on. That way you never miss out on a future conversation where Matt, Scott, and I dive into these unique wealth management discussions or really just interpersonal and life strategies strategy discussion uh you know we ultimately want to provide value here on the show and by subscribing you'll never miss out on a future episode so for scott and matt i'm ryan we're gonna go ahead and say so long but we appreciate you stopping by and being with us on path to abundant living <laughs>